It's got some wallpaper here. Yeah, it's either wallpaper or it's wall fabric. Fabric, it's sort of, it's covering, though, the, uh, the wall. Yeah, it covers, uh, like, all kind of fabrics. It covers something. In this case, a wall of um, uh, nondescript appearance, I suppose. Do you think that's all, uh, I could give you this image. Imagine that we just buried somebody and in, in, uh, we're burying him, we, we put him in the hearse and we're, we're going to bring him into the cemetery and we're saying prayer, prayers and we're throwing flowers and doing everything and then we're lowering the, uh, the coffin into the ground and we have this beautiful flowery prose verse, we have uh, whatever it is, we have this poetry covering the coffin, like this decoration covering the wall. Mm -hmm. Is that, what, is that what poetry is? I don't think so, because uh, it seems to me that the scene that you're describing is a ritual tied very closely to commercialism. For example, in the United States, uh, there, there was some expose about the undertaking business. And if you link the undertaking business with those flowers and the ritual, you have there perhaps an approach to reality which is not tied to the inner being of the real subject, in this case, the dead person. And poetry is the opposite. It's always tied to the real, to the essence of something, whether it's an object or person. To me, that would be the difference. And you, do you think that, you think there's any really, uh, there, there's a purpose, there's any kind of a uh, need for poetry in a, in a modern society where we have, you see, we've had trouble here with, uh, today with tapes, We've had problems with machines. There have been breakdowns. But on the other hand, we have men going to space. We have men controlling lives. We have media. We have television. We have fantastic inventions. I was bringing that, making that analogy with the decoration and, and, and actually uh, just what you were responding to. Is there any need in, in, a, in a society like ours today, in this kind of modern world, is there, number one, need for poetry? Is poetry, is a poet, is there a need for a poet, or is poetry dead? <laughs> Just like that person in the uh, cemetery. <laughs> well, I think that <clears throat> particularly in this modern technological society, there's a need for poetry. Because poetry goes to the heart of things. I would think that poetry is the soul of science and that it is the heart of human intentions. So that without, ma without poetry, man is not kept aware of why he has these marvelous inventions or of where they came from. These, these uh, marvelous inventions came from the imaginations of individuals who had a purpose. They had a purpose and they had materials to work with and art, essentially, is a product which is a result of working with materials for purpose. And I think the poetry reminds us what our purpose is in doing anything that we do, no matter how marvelous or how commonplace it may be. Now, you, you were saying uh, something about the uh, poetry. Uh, it's a product. Is it a product or is it a process? Is there an end to poetry, or it's just like an art, like a painter? When you when you write poetry, you or you your personal process, mm -hmm. are you really just doing some? Uh, you're you're dancing with words, with music, with sounds, with noises. It's like this erotic type of sensual dance and movement. That it's a process without an end, without a product. It's just that movement towards something which doesn't end. Well, nothing ends, as Chekhov knew when he was writing his short stories. And a process, it seems to me, is just a means of dealing with your heartbeat. You know you're alive and you dance. And when you dance, you're doing something with your recognition of the fact that you're alive. It has an end in the sense that everything has a finality. But it has a purpose in that Anything we do has a purpose, even if we don't know the purpose. And <clears throat> art perhaps expresses the usefulness of not having a finality, 
of not having a purpose, or we do something which doesn't end in our own knowledge. It doesn't end in the product which our knowledge and our feelings gave us, but it ends finally in the minds and the feelings of other people. And in that band of uh, recognition that stretches between them and us as they are reading or observing our art, whatever that art form may be. Hmm. Um, you've said that uh, you you were uh, you started writing. Uh, you didn't say, but you did you start writing poetry in New York or? No, I started uh, when I was a child out in the West and in Nebraska. I didn't keep it up because I was uh, discouraged when my junior high school principal made me read on the stage a Thanksgiving poem that I wrote. And I was so <laughs> mortified that I swore that I would never write any more poetry. But I did begin again. I would say about 1958 was the beginning of my real poetry writing. And that's when, and then you, you started doing a lot of, uh, uh, you started re doing readings also? Well, I, I read a lot ever since I was a child. I spent almost all of my nights as a child in the library. But in 1958, I, f I published my first serious poem. And I knew then that I would always write poetry. In addition to an, uh, another career? Oh, yes, in addition to making money. Poetry, <laughs> poetry is not a career. Not a career for me. A career, again, I tie with uh, making a visible li living. Uh -huh. And poetry... Instead of making a living for me, poetry is a means by which I try to prove that my being alive has meant something to me and to other people. Um, you had said uh, earlier uh, when I arrived that you had uh, come to Paris from New York. I was wondering if, uh, if you noticed when you, when you were walking around in Paris um, that the, the images, you're walking on the Pont Neuf, the bridge, you're walking through Paris in the daytime, the nighttime, it's very soft. There's, you don't feel that agitate. you might not feel that agitation. It might float a little here, whereas in New York, many artists have, have uh, said, you go, to, you, you go to New York and you're bombarded, you're hit mm -hmm. with that, with uh, uh, something that really just bombards you shocks you. Mm -hmm. It's a different mm -hmm. consciousness. Have you noticed in your process, your personal process of, either in your personal process of uh, writing poetry uh, or any other type of writing, that you've changed since you've been in Paris, or what, I've, what I'm asking and discussing, have you noticed this at all? And the, uh, the image of the, the images of softer here and it has affected you in a certain way. Yes, uh, the physical environment and the psychological environment of Paris aren't as abrasive as they are in New York. And also they don't have the particular history behind them that a person feels when he's walking down a New York street. Uh, Paris has a different image. It has an image of uh, beauty, a certain grandeur behind it that New York doesn't have. But for me, this is all exterior. It's, it's a physical and psychological environment which means less to me than, than the inner process which this outer environment permits. I write whenever I can. Now Paris allows me to write in a sense and in a way that New York did not. Principally, I, I suppose, because in Paris, the past that crowds in upon my mind is different from the past that crowded in upon my mind when I tried to write in New York. So the outer beauty of Paris, it seems to me, is paralleled by a kind of inner beauty that permits a, a poet, particularly, to write with a kind of uh, certitude that he is expressing something in himself rather that, than something that comes from the outside environment. I regard uh, the poetic process as an inner thing much more than 
obtains in uh, working in other mediums. Of course, I don't know a good deal about other mediums, but I know how a, a po and this I know how this poet writes, <laughs> and that's true for me. Uh, that's interesting. Then, in a sense, if I I'm not sure I, I I understand, but in New York, if you're saying it's right that. Uh, the, your, your own personal baggage or experience and circumstances, in a sense, could almost affect you more. And in Paris, not, it's not the external beauty here that could allow you to get in touch with your past or whatever you're trying to, uh, working on, to be working on at the moment, but it's almost more, it's like more of a neuter here, in a sense. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it's, neuter, my... it's, neuter, it's neuter in the sense that it frees the possibility of your own authentic expression. Now, of course, in my case, I'm indirectly thinking about uh, racism in the United States, which has so often affected my life and the life of other black poets, I'm sure, at critical points. Here, I don't feel it. I couldn't feel it here because my past here has so little to do with that same kind of uh, pernicious environment which I myself cannot uh, cannot abide, cannot tolerate. I guess every man's personal history is tied up with his own life and his family's life and the life of his closest friends. Now, in America, that kind of memory, in the end, didn't permit me to write with any uh, what Wordsworth would call recollection and tranquility that I could uh, that I could master here I found it and that's why I suppose I write more easily and more consistently uh, in Europe than I did back in the United States I see um, did you did you find um, I don't know how long you lived in New York or anything like that but did you uh, in New York United States mm -hmm. um, did you find that uh, there was a, a, as great, or there was a serious interest in New York in experimental poetry, in uh, poetry readings, and were you giving readings in New York? I know here I think you're giving, so I don't really know. Mm -hmm. I'm not giving many here now. I gave a few last year, and will, and will maybe give two, two this uh, very, very next month. But <clears throat> the the receptiveness toward poetry readings in Paris is greater than that in New York, as oh, far yeah. as, my, feel that way. as my personal experience is concerned. And then, too, we're dealing also uh, we're dealing with with uh, we're dealing with race in a way that I can forget when I'm here. It's it has been a fact, and I think it still is a fact, as far as my uh, connection with America tell me that. <clears throat> Black poets have a harder time getting heard in the United States than they do in Europe. Hmm. This uh, perhaps has less to do with literature and lit literature's quality than it has to do with governments and contemporary history. You see. Would you prefer that I didn't mention that in the interview? <clears throat> Well, I don't. Doesn't matter. You don't have to. You, know, you, you don't have to mention it. No, you could certainly leave it out because I, I express it in uh, the other written means that I have for recording my own my own life. You don't have to. You can leave it all. Out. No, no, no. You can't read the way if I put it in, or I mean, if I did put it in, does it? No, no. It doesn't. Doesn't matter because anything I say, I mean. Okay. <laughs> yes. I understand. Uh, oh yes. Some things are. You know. You know why right. I'm asking. Oh yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, where where will you be? Uh, you said uh, fairly soon you'll be giving two readings in Paris. Yes, I'm. When and uh, where will those be? I'm supposed to give one on the 16th of December oh. at uh, what is this place? It's Cannibal Pierce Galerie Austr Australienne, the Australian uh, Cannibal Pierce Gallery. Is it where? It's out in Saint Denis. Here it is. I see. Seven Rue Samson in Saint Denis. I see. At nine o'clock on the sixteenth, uh, mm -hmm. and I'll be giving one at Johnny's Bar, which is at fifty-five Rue Montmartre, perhaps on the 
previous Sunday, the 13th, but I won't know that until the 23rd when I go to hear Derry O'Sullivan, the Irish poet, read, and he's going to establish the date. You had, you had mentioned that you had, even, you, had, um, you had written one novel? I wrote a novel long ago. I wrote one novel, an autobiographical novel, my first and only novel, and I sent it to two publishers. At that time, I was so naive, I didn't know that some famous novels had been rejected 17 times. I'm trying to think of the name of the one. I can't. But I sent it to uh, Farrar, Cuddy, and Strauss. They said they couldn't print it, but they wanted to see my next novel. I was discouraged. I shouldn't have been. Then I sent it again to Little Brown and Company, and it came back in an envelope. When I looked at the envelope, I was sure it was bad news, and I never opened the envelope. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I never opened it. I was sure it was another rejection, and I was just so discouraged that I just left it in a trunk. And the novel, I lost a lot of my possessions in New York, and I lost the novel, so it's, that's all, all gone. Did, did, uh, did you find it was a different... Uh process writing a novel than writing poetry? Oh yes, I think poetry is harder. Harder? It's harder to me, yes. I, I used to write short stories too. I wrote short a lot stories. of short stories when I was a teenager and I thought they were all not good enough so I burned all of them up. But I think that writing uh, poetry is much more difficult. Than than short stories or novels? Yes, yes. A Why? novel, I can write. If when I sit, I'm uh, working on a novel, I sit, da sit down on any particular day, I can write. And I know I'm going to turn out to something maybe just as good as the last day. Poetry, I sit down. I can never be sure that anything of value is going to come to me. Only a single line. It's more mysterious. It's more outside a person's power. I'm talking about competent poetry. You can write verse. But poetry that, that's fairly good verse is, is almost out of your control. Verse is not poetry? No, I don't think so. Well, it depends on one's definition. Verse to me is uh, technically poetry, mm -hmm. technically, because of the way it's structured. But poetry is something that hits you. It has beauty and meaning and power and all of those things. But verse can just be something that's technically competent. So if you're playing a piano and you can do certain things, that uh, you can do certain exercise, exercises, that's playing the piano. Mm -hmm playing in a certain way, but that's not music. That's not real music. Do you read your, when you, when you write, do you read your uh, poetry out loud? Uh, uh, also, not the whole thing, but each, each phrase, every word I read, because if it doesn't yes. sound right, I won't use it. Out loud? Yes, out you loud. Know. Mm -hmm. Not too loud, but out loud. <laughs> 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 right. <laughs> uh, um, and you think, would you say uh, you're, there's some uh, poetry, so something so magical and musical in poetry, uh, inside the poetry? Uh, would you say you've been influenced uh, by, mu by, uh, by music in your background? Uh, yes, almost unconsciously. That is, my first inclinations to write were influenced by the fact that my mother used to read the Bible to all of her children. We'd have to gather around her and she'd read the Bible from an early age. I cared almost nothing about the religious message, but the beauty of the words and the rhythm struck me forcibly. And so ever since I began to write, I, I was moved, or I wanted to be moved, by the music, the melody, the rhythm, and the verse. And if the rhythm wasn't there, it uh, didn't seem like worthwhile poetry to me. And this tendency of mine has increased as the years have gone by. That, uh, Without, with no, if there's no rhythm, if there's no part of the of the beauty of poetry to me comes from its from its rhythm. And of course, rhythm is a part of being alive. You look out, see, I look down at those trees, and the pattern of the leaves on the tree indicates a rhythm. The way the wind moves those leaves observes and obeys a kind of rhythm that's in nature itself. And I think that any authentic life has rhythm in it. And then you're talking again about the motion and the dance of life. Yes, yes, yes. Right, right.
Do we need it? Do we need poetry? Yeah. Yes. Now you can ask, do we need to know why we do what we do? You can ask, do we need to believe that what we do is good? That what we do is worthwhile? That what we do benefits other human beings? The answer is yes. And poetry, in a sense, explains, without being explicit, why being alive is a meaningful thing. And why, and it, it explains why the things that we do ought to reflect and carry beauty. That being alive ought to make us feel good. The way hearing a beautiful poem makes your legs turn cold. So maybe if you do an exceptionally good deed, maybe the glow that it gives you is somewhat like the glow that you feel when you hear a fine poem. And there's a connection. There's a connection that, that these connections are melded inside your body so that you get the same feeling from different experiences. And this would seem to mean that your humanity sanctions similarly both or all of those actions. Hmm. I like that. <laughs> Um, is art is art imitating uh, life is poetry imitating life or is life imitating poetry doesn't matter I mean I'm not asking this amount of it well I think both are true poetry imitates life in that all all the things that we do that we consciously do imitate what our experience has taught us is worth perpetuating so this imitation is, this imitation of life by poetry is a necessary part of any human activity. Now, with regard to life imitating poetry, we might be dealing with the results of poetry. Maybe, let's say, you read good poems, you remember them, and in your later life, maybe the things that you do are in part a result of attitudes that you acquired as a result of reading those poems. So in that way, life can imitate poetry. I can't imagine a good deal of human evil proceeding from a recollection of poetry. <laughs> that would be hard for me to imagine. I guess it could happen. Anything can. But that would be difficult. And you, but yet, when we, feel, when we feel that we ought to do a certain thing because it's the right thing to do. The question is, how do we know that? Who taught us that? Or what taught us that? Now the answer to the what could be a poem. The answer to the who could be somebody who read poetry to us. Hmm. I think poetry is real. As a matter of fact, I think that the purpose of poetry is to capture the reality of life. The inner reality. The inner reality. And it's the and inner reality doesn't really mean anything in, unless it becomes an outer reality in the form of action. If inner reality is trapped and kept inside, what does it matter? Say if you feel something and no one ever knows you feel that way, what does it matter? So that the business of being alive is to let other people know what you feel. Otherwise, <laughs> you're all hung up. <laughs> you know, when you can't let people know what you feel or when your friends or your parents don't realize what you feel or the way you feel about things, you have a problem. Mm -hmm. So, the, so the, the purpose of being alive is to express yourself. And if you can't do that, you're, you know, you're a psychological case. <laughs> Got a lot of those walking around here. Oh, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> um, we say that... Uh, do you, do you uh, paint pictures also in terms of uh, with colors? No. I don't know if you paint as an artist. But no, I don't paint uh, as an artist. But do you I paint, pardon me, do you paint, uh, would you say in a, in a sense here, uh, by analogy, you're painting with uh, 
brush strokes, texture, you have texture in all. You're really trying to, to paint through through your poetry. Mm -hmm. Would you think that's... Uh, yes, I'm trying to paint, but I and all poets are, poets are trying to paint either ourselves or some part of life as interpreted by us through ourselves in the sense that painting and all the different aspects all of that the different aspects of, of, of painting involved that is shades texture color and all of that these are simply modes of human life that is human life has all of these things it has color it has texture it has lines it has shades and dark so that in a sense the most complex and beautiful picture that can be painted is the picture of any one human being in the world or anyone anyone any person that lives is a beautiful poem if he or she could be painted by somebody and are, are you doing that with your with your poetry are you painting the, the beauty of that that person yeah, I tried to paint a number of people, yes, and bring out their beauty. Although the, the beauty in them isn't always beautiful in the normal sense. For example, I think that, the, that one of the greatest beauties is the endurance of suffering. Not in a masochistic sense, I don't like to suffer. But to me, the, the most beautiful sight that a person can see is the sight, even if this sight is the knowledge, the sight of someone who has endured massive troubles and emerged as a human being, still possibly kind-hearted, still possibly generous, still possibly broad-minded, and these other things that we have grown to perceive as virtues. These are beautiful. That's, that's, that's beautiful painting. The fact that this can happen and it happens all around us every day in the lives of people, people who are absolutely common in the sense that we don't even, most of us, don't even think about them, although it's the business of poets to think about them. Do you, do you write, uh, you find yourself writing more in the nighttime, in the daytime, or? Well, <clears throat> whenever I can, whenever I can write. Now, I'm, wrapped up, I suppose, in what might be called the business aspect uh, of this poetry and just the business of doing things every day that you need to do <laughs> to, to keep alive. But any time that I can write, I write. I always have something to write. I have a stack of notes, what I call poem ideas, many of them. I wrote one today on my calendar. That's what I'm, I'm two days behind time, but that's the 16th. I have the poem, poem. Stonewall. I don't know where I got that from, but it occurred to me in putting down this note that being alive is, a, is the business of breaking down stone walls around you. Mm -hmm. It can be an obstacle. It can be, a, uh, to quote one of my titles of one of my recent poems, it can be a false notion. And it, many stone walls, and we're always breaking them down, and some we don't try to break down. And that can be either a virtue or a defect not to try to break down a stone wall. But this is my latest idea, which I put down. If I'll ever write it or not, who knows, but I won't let it fade into some invisible obscurity. Well, um, you teach also, don't you teach poetry? No, I, I taught literature. I never, I was asked to teach poetry <clears throat> a number of times, but I never would teach it because uh, poetry has always had such a deep meaning to me that I didn't want to get involved in arguments or discussions with students about things which I knew were fundamentally true and which they didn't really want to understand. But don't we have to transmit it, though? Who's going to be here? Let's say... You know, you're going to die and be go into that stone wall. So yeah, am I. Right, right, right. I mean, but, well, don't, but there don't, are people who love to teach poetry. But those aren't the, those aren't the people who should be teaching it. Those, I wrote a book on it. On, uh, on how to teach and understand uh -huh. poetry. That was my <laughs> contribution. And also, when I was teaching, students would often come to me with poems. I and I would always take the poems. 
and talk with them later about them. I see. But, but you I would never teach it. You, I understand. You, but you teach uh, some. You taught literature. Yeah, different kinds of literature. Yes. In the United, in New York or in New York, I introduced the teaching of black poetry in my university, 1966. I had never taught it before. In France, I taught in uh, Toulouse, University of Toulouse, the hardest course I ever taught. I was asked to teach. Believe it or not, it was a course on my poetry. Very difficult. <laughs> For you? Very difficult because I had to think about my poetry in academic terms. Mm -hmm. I'd never done that before. Very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Were you teaching this in French? Oh, no. No, no. I would teach nothing in French. If I could teach myself something in French, that would be great. But I've been, <laughs> I've been uh, so busy writing all the time that I have never mastered uh, French. I can bumble around, you know, yeah. on the street and with uh, merchants, but I couldn't hold an intelligent conversation for more than yeah. 15 seconds. 15 seconds <laughs> in, in acceptable French. I don't think I could. Some people would tell me I could, but I don't believe it. <laughs> um, is there a, when you write a poem, when anyone writes a poem, is there a, are you expressing uh, the voice, inside the voice, inside the voice of the collective voice of uh, humanity or of everybody walking on the street Everybody uh, inside, a, there's a rock or a stone or people on the metro. Is, it the, is there a voice that you're, that the poet is, uh, uh, that there's a poem that has to be written? I don't know, uh, yesterday it was Stonewall. Mm -hmm. Was this voice, was there this voice that, uh, uh, not this mysterious voice, you know, the, this collective voice that had to be uh, um, expressed? I don't think that most poets think about that. But I think it's impossible to, to write anything without expressing, in some degree, the collective voice of humanity. For one thing, the ability to write was taught to us through uh, a skill which represented the collective voice of humanity. The very medium by which we write is a collective medium. And whether we want to or not, we're expressing, we can express only the things that we have heard or have read or have absorbed through our being alive among n uh, innumerable other people. So more, some people may declare, and I've heard them declare, I, say, I write poetry only for myself. I don't want anybody else to read it. I don't care if it ever gets published. Some people say, I write it for myself. Now when they say that, I believe them. I believe they mean what they say, but I don't believe that what they say is true. I think it's impossible that you've got to be expressing the voice of humanity unless you are so perverse and so odd that there is no one else like you. No such person exists. <laughs> Nobody is that unique, you see. So you've got to be expressing the voice of many, many, many people. Even if you don't want to, you've got to, be, you've got to do it. Um, is there anything... Um that you think is, uh, oh, I see, you're in, I see you have a thing with horses. Yeah, yeah, Founder. I used to, yeah, I used to, I used to. Oh, you ride horses? Or? I used to herd cattle for a living, and work on ranches, a kind of cowboy. You know, I used to herd so all, like to? all day long, yes. Oh, so you ride horses. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You still ride? Or? No, I don't ride much now, but I used to ride all day long, every day, <laughs> <laughs> which is work. That's work. Yeah, yeah. That is hard. Oh yes. oh, yes. That is hard. Yeah, of course it is. <laughs> um, is there anything that um, might be uh, of interest in terms of process, poetry, or anything like that, or that I, that uh, I, in this brief time, hmm. in my little way, uh, have tried to um, ask you about anything that 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 you think that I might not have. Uh, touched on that might be uh, um, interesting or not interesting but important um, in terms but of... Uh, there probably are, but, <laughs> it's, but it's probable that I would not at the moment <laughs> be able to say what they are. Uh -huh. See, because it's very hard to touch on all 
important things of anything unless you study it for weeks and weeks and weeks in advance. I would say one thing that was all, has always uh, occurred to me is important about the perception of poetry, and that is that people or an audience should never expect anything from a certain poet. Sometimes people will say, well, I look at a poet's name, and they'll say, well, if he's got this name, this name's a certain kind of name, and therefore he represents a certain group of people. Therefore, he's got to be writing a certain kind of poetry. I don't like that because it, it controverts the very nature of humanity. Uh, a writer is uh, a writer, and he writes not... Uh, not out of, even out of his own national circumstances necessarily, let alone racial or any other kind of circumstance. He might write anything at all. I think of, just take a case, Baraka. Most people who know Baraka's poetry, Leroy Jones, they expect a certain kind of hard-hitting, knock-down, thrash him, kill him poetry from him, or at least they did expect that maybe in the 1970s, and yet I've seen some of the poems of Baraka that I admire are the exact opposite. And you would read the poem, react to it feelingly, and never dream that a person like the person you think Baraka is could have written it. And so I like, I, I wish that people would give any artist credit for his own humanity and allow him to write in any way he pleases, just so the product is something good, something useful, something hopefully beautiful that they can admire without having to put him in one little corner and say, since, since I think he comes from this corner, he's got to express that corner. You can't do that. Does that make, maybe it's an idea to write under a pseudonym? I don't think that would help. If you did it, if you did it, you, you would know that you're hiding your real name. Now, I've never written under a pseudonym that I can remember, but, but I would, in a sense, think that I was someone else if I used a different name. Right. And in, write, in, in writing or in being any kind of artist, one thing you've got to do is to come ter to terms with yourself. But then people wouldn't know where, they wouldn't have that, they wouldn't categorize you, they wouldn't put you in that, uh, well, this is him, this is him. They would just read it for what it is. Yes, but uh, the people who write the anthology would know. And they wouldn't let you into that anthology unless they accepted you into the category that was in your mind. For example, I read, I read an article in the New York Times Book Review, I think it was in 1980, in February, mm -hmm. which uh, I think I almost know the date, February the 20th, which said that uh, American publishers were no longer interested in black writers. Now, this was in the New York Times Book Review. They wouldn't have printed that. It was a whole essay. Right. if it had not been a substantial fact. So here's an example of a whole nation or a national group of powerful publishers who wanted only certain things from, a, from an identifiable group of writers. And if these writers weren't producing that thing, they wouldn't touch it. And evidently the time came when they wanted nothing from this particular group of writers. Now, I would like to see this attitude all over the world disappear. A writer is a writer. And you might, you probably will get something from him which fruitfully expresses something about his own country, if you know what his country is. But I would hope that he would be able to say something that anybody in the world who can read his language, or even read it in translation, if you've got a good translator, and by the way, I work with an excellent translator, an excellent illustrator now. It's one of the new things I'm going into. Oh, yes. That, uh, that such people would understand it and, and hope that from, from any given writer might come anything, that they would expect anything to come from it. That would be good. Are you a, uh, a writer or, or a poet? Would you say you're a poet or... You think about yourself. Well, I think of myself now as a poet. I used to write a good deal of literary criticism, books, essays, many, but uh, I stopped. I stopped, and I never started it again. Well, as I told you, this August I wrote seven songs. I don't write songs, but in in August I wrote seven songs. You wrote with the, the, with the music, the lyrics, or the uh... lyrics. I can't write music, but I imagine the music, and I sang them into a cassette that's in the other room. 
And I had never done that before. So I surprised myself. So I would hope that audiences would welcome such surprises from any writer. Right. And to say he might just do anything and be ready for it. And be ready to take it as an authentic product from him or from her. Do you miss New York? Not at all. United States? No, no. So you're, you might stay up here for a while. Yeah, I, and, and uh, you know, if I, until I don't like it anymore. It's not good to miss places. I, I, one of my favorite writers is Thoreau. And he believed, like some of the writers, you carry your own place around with you. And that the only continent worth discovering to Thoreau was, it was the continent of yourself. So I, I believe that. Yeah, but he lived in the woods. <laughs> no, he, uh, no, he didn't write it. He didn't write <laughs> it. I, I saw his place where he lived in the woods. I did too. All those stones, yeah. but Thoreau didn't nice. live in the woods. His his body lived in the woods, but Thoreau didn't live in the woods. Did All, right. he? All those books that he read about Oriental philosophy and other things, right. he didn't live in the woods. <laughs> no, <laughs> no uh, he, was, he was one of the great writers of that time. Oh, well, I think I probably. Uh, Hit enough things. To, uh, okay. All right. Yeah. All right. As I said, I'm moving into uh, translation now. My my translator, a man from Caen named uh, Jean Miguel, yeah. just recently sent me a whole book of my poetry in French. In French, he, seventy-five pages. And somebody so I, somebody else told you he was good. Uh yeah. Because you wouldn't really know. I wouldn't really know, but, but other people have told me. People that other teach. Other Americans. No have French. Been. French. Yeah. Now, I don't know. I would like to find out through having some of his stuff published, as I hope to do in the Press Atlantic, uh -huh. and having some people say to me, well, it's very good, or it's uh -huh. mediocre, or it's not so good. I would like his work to be tested. Right. I think it's probably a good idea. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. I have very high doubts. <laughs> I have very strong doubts uh -huh. about any of these, about a translation. Uh -huh. Well, you know, a translation has to fail. It has to. It has to fail. It has to. Yeah. But look at all the translations we have. And so, literary people. The question is, to what degree do they care whether it's going to fail or not? They must not care so much, or they must realize that it's so um, it's so it's so necessary a failure that we can forget that fact and go on to the appreciation of the translation. Pardon me, one second. I just thought one second. Are we moving into uh, in poetry and in writing? Are we moving away from the conscious, the mind? Are we moving towards another plane when you said that we were in the inside, you know, mm -hmm. away from the decoration? Are we moving towards probing the unconscious or just moving towards another territory? Well, I guess the unconscious is another territory. Right. A territory different from the conscious different. mind. And it's one that uh, is there, linked with the conscious. Mm -hmm. And so I guess in order to fully understand the conscious, you have to have some a uh, true understanding of the unconscious. Uh, so as to, if you want to get a proper view of the body, you have to know something about the spirit, even though you can't know much about it. But maybe poetry, oh, maybe what you're saying is, poetry is the spirit. Yes. Somebody said that poetry was the, <clears throat> Wordsworth or Coleridge, or one of those writers said that poetry is the breath, maybe it was Milton, Poetry is the breath and finer spirit of all knowledge. The breath, I like that. <laughs> and you, could, you couldn't ignore what they said. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, uh, I thank you. You're, there, uh, you're quite welcome. I've enjoyed uh, going over these thoughts. Well, I hope so. Yeah. I hope they uh, might give you an idea for a poem. Yeah, they might indeed. That's always a good result of anything that happens. <laughs> I, uh, I look forward to reading. Um, I would have liked to. Uh, even, I, I would have liked to actually read, uh, but I guess I'll be reading them in the Paris Atlantic. Mm -hmm. I would have Here's liked to read a, a few of my. This is my. You haven't seen. I don't think even Michael Lynch has seen this book. It just came out last month. This oh. is my latest book. Book. I don't think he's seen it. No. Are you going to see him yes. soon? Yes. You know what I I want I'm going to see him. him. I'm going to see him on uh, either on Saturday or on Wednesday. Would you 
You want me to give him this? Uh, let me autograph it, and if you give it to him, because sure. I wanted to give him a copy. Are you friends with him? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, I haven't seen him many times, but uh, uh, he's, uh, we've talked. He's gentleman. Several times, yeah. yes. Oh, sure. I'd like to do that. And I'll be able to take a look at, uh, I'll be able to read right. it. Too. Huh? And I wanted, do you know his uh, thoughts about this new issue, his yes. approach, uh, his uh, general approach? In terms of? Do you know whether he would be interested? The, the artist that I work with, Nicole Lamotte, Lamotte yeah. was famous. Right. She did all of these and the poems and the illustrations in this book she did. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if Michael would like for me to send along one or two uh, for the of cover? her illustrations. I'll tell you what I'm interested in. Hmm? What? I'll mention that to Michael. I think he would have been very interested. I live with a... Uh, are you still recording? Yes, yeah, so long. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I live, until recently, uh, we'll see what happens, I live with a, a French artist mm -hmm. who Michael likes very much, mm -hmm. the, uh, her art. Mm -hmm. And I told him, no, we weren't interested. At this point, I think... No, he needed a cover for the Paris Atlantic, mm -hmm. which is what you're talking about, really, is a cover. No, I'm not talking about a cover. I'm oh, an illustration. I'm wondering whether or not he would be interested in an illustration of any one of the poems that he puts okay. into this. I'm going to speak to him tonight or tomorrow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That might be very interesting. I know what I'm interested in, mm -hmm. um, if you happen to have one here. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be writing this article for... for uh, I'm giving it in on Friday. Well, I can cut this off again. Okay, sure.